Welcome to this tutorial on how to read a genomic test report. We will cover the structure of the report, which summarizes the referral reason and provides the genomic test result itself before explaining its implications, further testing the lab recommends and test limitations noted on the report. We will also briefly define more technical terms you may see in the report, including the RNA transcript and genome build. This is an example of a genomic test report. This one is from the North Thames Genomic Laboratory Hub. Other GLH reports may look different, but the same type of information is included. This particular report is two pages long and contains a lot of information, and that's reflective of how complicated genomic data can be. The report usually starts with the referral reason and the associated gene panel that has been analysed for the patient. In our example here, it is the Vascular Skin Disorder Panel, or R326. It's important to check this section of the report carefully to ensure that the phenotypic information is correct and correlates with your original request. Providing detailed clinical information is important to ensure correct gene panels are applied, aid variant interpretation when determining gene phenotype specificity, and ensure that only variants considered relevant to the patient's clinical phenotype are reported. Any discrepancies could mean that the test or analysis performed for the patient is not correct. Next, you'll find the result summary. The summary is the take home message of the report and is clearly written in bold font. In this example, we can see that a molecular diagnosis of glomivenous malformation has been confirmed for the patient. Below the result summary, there is a more detail about the result, including any variants identified and evidence for their classification. These three sections provide information about the result in varying degrees of detail. Let's have a look at the detail about the test result. This will include one, the genetic technique used. In this case, next generation, otherwise known as massively parallel sequencing. Two, whether the variant has been detected in the heterozygous, homozygous or hemizygous state. Three, which gene the variant resides in, here in the glomulin or GLMN gene. Four, the variant nomenclature. Briefly, Variants are described using a specific standardised language known as HGVS description. So here at this nucleotide position 647 in the glomulin gene, the thiamine nucleotide has been changed to an adenine, a T to an A change, and has a result at the protein level, a leucine amino acid at this position 216 in the amino acid chain has been substituted to a top stop codon marked as an asterisk, which will cause a truncation of the protein. Five, how the lab has classified the variant. In other words, have we classified it as likely pathogenic, pathogenic or a variant of uncertain significance? And six, the gene disease association with reference to the disorder and the gene's omen ID. Here, the lab has described that the glomulin gene is associated with glomivenous malformation which fits with the patient's clinical presentation. Further down the report, we can see in the position labelled 7 more technical details about the variant, including the evidence that has been used to classify it, which is derived from the ACMG ACGS frameworks. Here the report outlines that because the variant was not seen in healthy individuals and has introduced a premature stop codon that would lead to a truncated dysfunctional protein product, the variant has been classified as pathogenic. Number eight, under technical information shows that the gene variant described in relation to its RNA transcript, also known as its reference sequence, to provide a more complete variant description. Next, we will explain this technical information. Most clinicians reading a report will not need to drill into this level of detail, but will cover it briefly for those who are interested and for the sake of completeness before moving on to the rest of the report. First, we will expand on the concept of transcripts and why they are so important, because it can be a bit tricky to grasp. Let's start with RNA splicing. This is a process that removes the non-coding sequences known as introns and joins the coding sequences known as exons in the RNA transcript. On the image of the SCN1A gene here, the exons are shown in the dark orange bars, which are interrupted by the introns shown as the dark orange lines in between the exons. Alternative RNA splicing produces different combinations of exons to either be included into or skipped 
from the final RNA transcript. This results in differences in sequences and lengths between the different transcripts shown here in blue. Alternative RNA splicing is a mechanism that enables a single gene to code for multiple proteins. This can, for example, allow tissue-specific gene expression. When describing a variant, the C number refers to the position of the variant in the coding DNA sequence, that is, the exons only. In each case, the numbering starts with C.1 at the A of the ATG start codon. Because variant nomenclature is only concerned with the nucleotide's position in exonic or coding DNA and not the intronic sequences which have been spliced out, the same variant shown with the red arrow may have a different nucleotide position in the coding DNA, the C number, and corresponding amino acid position, the P number, in different transcripts. So having a variant description without a reference sequence is near useless like having the street name without the postcode for an address. This demonstrates why it is crucial to check transcripts match when cross-referencing the variant stated on the report with, for example, the same variant published in the literature, because the same variant may be described differently with different transcripts. So we've covered numbering at the gene transcript level, but how is the position of a variant described in terms of its position in the genome? First, let's look at genome builds. A genome build is an attempt to reconstruct the full human genome sequence. The human reference genome is updated all the time to represent advances in understanding. The most up-to-date genome build currently is labelled GRCH38, also known as HG38. GRCH38 has superseded the previous version, GRCH37, also known as HG19, which was subject to sequencing gaps and artefacts. The genomic coordinate is the name given to the position of a particular nucleotide along the genomic sequence at a given chromosome. As it is the genomic sequence and not coding or non-coding DNA, it is not subject to RNA splicing. However, the numbering of a genomic coordinate will shift as a result of the chopping and adding of the sequence in the different builds. Therefore, the genomic coordinate is only informative if you know the genome build on which it is based. Historically, genomic test reports have tended to include the genome build and genomic coordinate. Nowadays, some labs do, but others may not. In the illustration, the orange box represents the SCN1A gene, which is located on chromosome 2. Please note that this is not a scale. The red arrow shows the genomic coordinate of a C to a T variant change on build CRCH37, but the same variant on a different build the more up-to-date GRCH38 will have a different coordinate numbering. So if you were to see this coordinate, genomic coordinate on a report, it wouldn't mean much unless it is stated with its corresponding genome build. Let's look again at the test report. The next section describes the implications of the test result. Variants classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic are clinically actionable and may have implications for the management of the patient and their wider family. If a causative variant has been found, the report may mention the chance of passing this on to offspring, depending on the mode of inheritance. For example, this report highlights that as a pathogenic heterozygous variant has been identified, offspring of the patient have a 50% chance of inheriting the variant. The next section highlights if any further testing is recommended. As a clinician, it's important to look at this section to see if any follow-up actions are required. For example, if a variant of uncertain significance has been identified, where the evidence just falls short of a classification of likely pathogenic, the report may suggest further testing to aid a more definitive classification. This could include testing parents to see if the variant has arisen de novo, or if there's a strong family history, testing other affected relatives in the family to see if the variant is segregating within the family or RNA studies to assess variants that may affect splicing. Where a clearly causative variant has been identified, as in the report shown here, this section would highlight further action that would need to be taken. For example, recommending referral to the local clinical genetic service for counselling and cascade testing in the wider family. And finally, the fine print of a genomic report. Where a clinically actionable variant has not been identified, 
we often use the phrasing, a molecular diagnosis has not been confirmed or excluded. In other words, we haven't identified a genetic cause, but we also haven't ruled out the possibility that there is one. It is important to remember that there are limitations to both the test and the reporting. In terms of the limitations of the reporting, not all analysed variants are fed back. For example, variants of uncertain significance with insufficient evidence. Even if classed as likely pathogenic or pathogenic, only the variants that are relevant to the patient's phenotype are reported. This again emphasises the importance of providing complete and correct clinical information at the time the test is requested, as this will affect which variants are analysed. There are also limitations to the test itself, which are highlighted in this part of the report. In the panel and coverage information section, it quotes the average gene coverage for a given panel. So what this percentage here means is that 99.8 of the coding sequence analysed has been covered by at least 20 reads. If you did receive a negative report, but were clinically suspicious of a particular gene, you can contact the lab to find out if the coding sequence of that individual gene has been sufficiently covered. The test information also in mentions general test limitation. Sequencing tests have low sensitivity for copy number variants. These may not be reliably picked up, so an additional test such as microarray may be used. Low frequency mosaic variants may be missed. Mosaic variants are those only present in a subset of the body cells. And if the level of mosaicism is low, the test may not have sufficient read depth to detect them. Variants that are common in the healthy population are filtered out because they are generally considered benign. However, in some circumstances, a common variant could act as a hypomorphic allele. That is having reduced rather than totally absent function for a recessive condition. These tend to be filtered out and therefore not picked up by the test. Lastly, deep intronic variants, so those not near the intron exon boundary, may not be sequenced, even though they can be a rare mechanism for disease pathogenicity. We will go into more detail about the limitations of genomic testing in another tutorial, but for now, just note that a negative report not only means that a molecular diagnosis has not been confirmed, but can also mean that it hasn't been excluded.